uh, in an organized way uh, that's beneficial to you uh, and your congregations, uh, but also informal in that we want this to be the start of a relationship. Uh, we want you uh, to network both with the presenters, uh, with, with uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the ADL, uh, and also with each other, uh, because there are solutions in this room, there are best practices in this room, and those ought to be shared. Uh, in terms of, of, of the importance of this event, I, I'm reminded of the hostage situation in Colleyville, Texas. Uh, the rabbi at the synagogue there uh, noted uh, after that situation that they had received some useful training uh, that helped. And that is our, our goal. We hope that this is a useful training that maybe develops into a policy that you never, ever, ever have to put into practice. Uh, but in the event that you do, uh, we want you to be prepared. Uh, the first assistant from my office, uh, Kurt Erskine, wave your hand, Kurt, uh, is going to be our MC for the, the day. He'll uh, get the planes in the air and on the ground uh, on time. Uh, but it's my privilege to start the introductions by introducing Greg Erie. Uh, Greg is the Vice President of Law Enforcement and Security uh, at the ADL. Greg's making his way this way. Uh, Greg's had a distinguished career both in the United States military uh, and over 20 years with the FBI uh, where he has worked on some international matters and particularly sort of near and dear to my heart, uh, some domestic terrorism matters. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Greg Erie. The U.S. Attorney might be a little taller than I am. I apologize. Um, I'm going to start by, and I'm used to this from my experience with the FBI, but also with the ADL. I wish this was a happier topic. And to echo our friend and uh, the U.S. Attorney Buchanan, it's not, but it's one that we have to talk about. Uh, I'm glad we all came here today. That's the first step, that we're all having this conversation and we're talking to each other frankly and transparently, because to be honest, we're not seeing that too much in the country. So I'll take you, I'm going to be one of your quicker speakers because I really want to get to some of my colleagues up here who are going to, and then get to your questions, which are most important about this. Very simply, I get asked a lot, how did you make this transition? And I'll, I'll end, start the story where it should end. I'm a very lapsed Irish Catholic. I was in the FBI. What am I doing in the ADL? And what am I doing here? And it's because of this mission. Uh, when I was in the Bureau, when I thought about retiring, and as you can see, you can retire at 35. That was a joke, you can say that. Uh, I got ready, I was, in, I was running the New Jersey office, and I said, well, what do I want to do now? Because uh, in the Bureau, there's certain age requirements where you have to retire. And I got approached by the ADL, and if you're in law enforcement, you absolutely have worked with the ADL at some point, uh, either in one of their training classes, a seminar, or just dealing with them, there, there's a close relationship. And an official approached me, Jonathan Greenblatt, the CEO, and said, we're thinking about forming this relationship, uh, or, or making this position with law enforcement and security. I said, okay, Jonathan, tell me about it. And I realized it would be exactly what I was missing when I left the, the Bureau, that mission. There's a mission to work with people like yourselves to help protect people. And it's not a cliche and it's not trite. If you spend your decades doing that, it was an opportunity to continue doing it. So this is what brings me here today. On the outlook, and you saw the, what we're speaking about is some of the trends in the hate crime look. I really, and we were speaking over here with, again, some of my colleagues you're gonna hear from, I really hope for that day where I can tell you this is not the highest year. This is not the worst we've seen, but it happens every year. The numbers keep going up. And there's not a silver lining, but there is some optimism to that. What we're seeing from the ADL and with Secure Community Network and with our friends from other denominations is certainly the threat is out there, but we're also working together to understand it more. And the terrible analogy that I often make is right now, think about the pandemic. How are we and how did we get our arms around this? Because we looked at it. We diagnosed it. Where were the centers? Why is this happening? Why is it happening in this location? With hate crimes and the trends we're seeing, it's the same thing. The kind of behind the scenes view, and this is not new, as U.S. Attorney Buchanan said, I spent most of my career working domestic terrorism for the FBI, well before it became what it is today. And we see the same problems with hate crimes and domestic terrorism, is it's underreported. We can't find those centers. We can't diagnose it accurately because the data is not there. And the part of that is the data comes from you. 
Are you reporting? Are you working with your law enforcement officials? Are law enforcement officials taking that data in and helping us get that full picture so that we can appropriately look at it, put assets out there? And the answer, unfortunately, right now is no. None of us are doing our job the way it should be done. We can say just from my portfolio in the ADL, what I do is work with law enforcement nationally. And I can tell you, and it's not a slant, and I'll, I'll stick up for the FBI on this, when they collect the data every year and push it back out, that is exactly and all they're doing. They're collecting the data that's submitted to them. They're not analyzing it. They're not judging it. They're saying we can only put out what we get. And right now, out of all the law enforcement agencies in the country, nationally, who can report, roughly around 20% report anything. Now think about that for a minute. My college average was a little higher than that. You know, when we I said 20% just isn't hacking it. How do you diagnose? How do you say that's accurate? We've worked very hard with my partners, with colleagues, with you, to get out there and say why, find out the root causes of that problems. We're incremental, incrementally getting a little bit better. We're moving it up. And when I say that, we, we specifically with law enforcement, last year we managed a 14% increase in law enforcement agencies that are reporting. Again, not a great number, but better than nothing, better than what we had before. This year, on top of that, we managed an 83% increase. And that's going door to door to departments to say, what's the problem? How can we fix this? Is it just a communications issue? Is there a political thing that we can help you with? So we're making small gains, but it's not good enough. The other half of that, besides law enforcement, is the community. Are you taking those steps? Are you reporting an incident when it happens? It's so easy, and I understand it. Do I want to call the police? Do I want to get them involved? What does that mean to my congregation? What happens to that community? Are they going to be nervous? Are we still going to be able to do it? We understand that, and there's mechanisms to work that appropriately. But the first step is picking up that phone. And I can tell you from experience, and my, uh, my friends in law enforcement will tell you this, it's the small things that get unreported, or you ignore, or you hide. It won't go away. It's going to get worse. You're hoping for things that aren't going to happen, to say, this was that one graffiti incident. This was, oh, this was just a childish prank. Oh, this was just somebody fill in the blank. No, it's not. It's we see these precursors and time and time again, when we go back and an incident, a large incident happens or a tragic incident, and we look back forensically, there were signs. And people say, I thought so, or we saw that before. And we can't do that anymore. And this is not denominational either. This is not just coming from the Jewish community or the Episcopal community or any the Baptist community. It's coming across the board. I bring it this, uh, this point to you today to say I, I tr always try to get the optimistic side in there. Well, you're going to say, Greg, this is depressing. How do we get better? Look around this room. And I'm talking very extemporaneously. As I sat in the back, I mentioned some of the denominations we saw. We're recognizing that it's not just a problem of one community, that it affects all of us. We're holding forums like this where we bring each other together. I can tell you from a federal law enforcement and a military background, the biggest tragedies and the biggest crises that we did not get right happened when we weren't talking to each other. You can go back to a recent one, but certainly not our most recent, 9-11, where we realized as the CIA, as the NSA, as all the intelligence community, we were purposefully not sharing with each other for whatever reason. And how stupid does that look now to say we had information that we could have collectively brought together and helped each other? But we didn't, and I always stop right there. There's no I didn't. You just didn't. There's no reason behind it. It doesn't matter how good you thought or how important it was at the time. It wasn't good enough. And the community and our population and our country suffered for it. You bring that down to this community level. If you're in the Episcopal Church, if you're in the Baptist Church, if you're in a Jewish temple, if you're in a mosque, if you're in the Sikh community, and you're seeing incidents, why aren't you talking to your partners? Why aren't you holding a forum like this and getting in a community and saying, Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I've done about it. Or more importantly, what should I do? Can we talk to each other? Do you have a best practice? Do you have something we can do to help each other? You're seeing that not only in this room today, but you're going to hear some of the speakers talk about it. We have formed a net with the U.S. Attorney's Office, with colleagues from the FBI and other law enforcement, with the Secure Community Network, with other denominations of your security directors to say, we recognize this failing. And we're all sitting here together to tell you we're speaking, we're talking at a level that we've never spoken before. We've certainly known each other, we've certainly respected each other, but now we're saying, I need help. I need you to help my community. What are you seeing in your community? And together, that net gets tighter and tighter. I can promise you, the U.S. Attorney mentioned uh, Coleyville. 
And it's, again, I'm stealing from a conversation we were just having. I speak with Rabbi Charlie once in a while, a wonderful man. And he is the first one, a humble, humble, humble human being who refuses to be dragged into a media spotlight. And he'll tell you, they're trying to make me a celebrity. They're trying to bring me out there and endorse things. I don't do that. I'm here for my congregation, and I don't want to become that person. But most importantly, he says, we certainly, and his story speaks for itself and his congregation story, we knew there was going to be an issue or potentially something could happen. And we trained, prepared, spent money, talked to our colleagues about it. And when you see his whole story, it wasn't just the Jewish community that came together to help. It was that entire community of Colleyville. And what he says always resonates with me. He says, Greg, I'm from Colleyville, Texas. Nobody, if you're from Texas, I apologize, knew the town's name before this happened. Nobody. We're a small community. We're a small congregation. Yes, we did some forethought. There is no one who will tell you that that congregation and that rabbi for prevention programs and partnership at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. She'll be joined by Protective Security Advisor Zach Williams, who is uh, the security... Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also at the Department of Homeland Security. So if we could have our next speakers come up, that would be great. Good afternoon. I was actually enjoying the, um, the less formal setting that we, we were having just a few minutes ago. Because when we're in a less formal setting, that means that we're really all together. We're on the same page, we're on the same level, we are working together. And that's what we have to do when it comes to um, taking action against domestic violent extremism. That is what's happening right now in our country, targeted violence um, and do domestic violent extremism. Um, I want, I am here to, somewhat talk about the threat, but also I liked um, what the last speaker said. I like the, the, the sunny side of the street um, and how we can prevent these May 2022 from happening. We know so that a young man went into a okay, school. So, oh, great, they got my slide back. That's awesome. Thank you. I want to first just give you a little bit of an update that we're faced with today. Um, on June 7th, um, it's Dynamic, Dynamic um, but Alejandro it Mayorkas covered our entire of community Homeland security. He wanted to call start our there national terror so that we could advisory set the ground, set the stage. Um, we had just got As you said, my name is Jaquita Bass. I am with the Department of Homeland several, Security Center for Prevention Programs and Several recent violent attacks by LUNS. We're looking in April 2022. I am here locally in Atlanta. The attack on the New York City. At least 15 others um, across the um, country. Um, I'm doing the same work that I am doing. We're called they Regional Prevention Coordinators. Um, social media. I serve as um, Georgia. Just saw that. The Carolinas and Texas. Any gaps, any requirements, if you need resources, those are the types of things we would like to hear. I want to be able to take this information back to my leadership and see what we can get done. So we um, work, we help to build these prevention networks. One, we, we work with the communities. We help to build partnerships. I've been working with the U.S. Attorney's Office, working with the um, FBI to host several roundtables over the course of last year um, and the, the various extremist movements and, and um, here. So what you saw in Buffalo, we consider that to be racially et and ethically motivated um, an attack. Um, but you also saw in Michigan a few years, a couple of years ago now, that was an anti-government um, that was labeled as an, an anti-government attack against the um, governor there. And then here are some others. Um, one thing I want to point out is that here in, in our country, we have our we have laws, we have rules, and we have our amendments. And so you can believe what you want to believe. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you take action, violent action, in, in, um, uh, as a part of those beliefs, that's when it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem for law enforcement, um, and it becomes a problem for um, where you're, you're actually breaking a law. So 
here's a definition of targeted violence. And when we think of mass attacks, we think of three or more um, people who have been um, killed or, or um, attacked or, or shot. Um, we also think of targeted violence as an intentional act um, to cause something to happen. And you may be doing that um, based on a grievance that you've had. Um, and there are a number of, of things and factors that we want to talk about. But we also want to talk about preventing that, preventing and intervening in some of those actions, all in the hopes of getting someone off the pathway of violence. So here's the understanding radicalization to violence process. And unfortunately, I don't have my slides in front of me, so I'm having to, to look here. So the radicalization to violence process, it is the, initially it is a thought. It's just a thought. It's, it's the ideation piece of it, where something has affected me. I, there are factors. I lost my job. Um, I'm upset, I'm angry about something, and these are perceived um, thoughts. That's just thinking about it, but mobilization is when you act on something, when you are acting on that idea, so you're mobilizing to violence. When we think of prevention, we take when we think of violence prevention, we look at the science um, from groups such as um, CDC and others who have been on the forefront of prevention. And so one of these, um, one of the studies they've done, they, what we know is that as individuals, we, we come into this world alone, we, live, we leave this world alone, but we also want to be in relationship with others. When, that, when we get into a situation where we're not, then that is a problem. Maybe you, you start to um, pull back socially. Um, you start to maybe have some um, mental health issues or some other um, crisis type um, issues. We also want to be a part of community, and we also want to be uh, accepted by society. So if we can pull that together, provide those support services and resources, then we could potentially get someone off of a pathway of violence. Here are examples of factors that could influence um, radicalization to violence. Based on these, what are some of those other ones? What are other things you've seen um, in your congregations, in your communities, in your own families that may possibly send someone what we like to call over the edge? And then those indicators. Um, the last speaker talked about how, do, how are you reporting? When you see something, do you, do you recognize those signs? Um, what are those concerning behaviors? Um, being a bystander, what does that mean? Being an, an active bystander, an upstander, sometimes we like to call that. Um, we like to make sure that people know where to report, how to get that information in, or what to do about it, because sometimes it starts right there with you. Some of our current activities, as you can see here, we, as a um, supporting prevention, we look at it through a public awareness and engagement um, lens. We provide community awareness briefings. Um, we, we've been working, um, Zach and I have been planning a number of interfaith um, briefings and, and convenings such as this one. But we also hope to provide threat assessment and threat management capabilities, trainings, helping to build your skill sets around threat assessment. And then also collecting those support services, knowing where do I go, who do I turn to if I'm having an issue. As I mentioned before, there are 15 um, regional prevention coordinators across the country doing the same thing, working in different areas. 
talked about the training as well. We also host what we call digital forums. We can do resilience exercises. But the main thing is, what are your needs? And we can sit down and talk through that, brainstorm some ideas, consult with you, if, especially if you're, you're having an issue as well. If there's, if there's a, a, one of your congregants, you, you've seen some of those concerning behaviors, some of those signs, then we can talk with you on and give you some um, um, guidance on how to um, seek the appropriate uh, resources. We offer um, a number of publications. Um, I'll make sure that if there's a follow-on email, you can you will receive all of the information from the website. And let's see, I missed my grants slide here. There we are. And this is my this is usually my ending slide. We do offer grants. In the last two years, we've offered thirty million dollars worth of grants. Um, this year, we're offering twenty million. Um, unfortunately, the um, application process closed um, in May. But if you're interested, we can start. I can help you to get. Um, give you more information, start you on the, we have a number of webinars and that, that sort of thing um, to help you to apply for those grants. And then my, my question to you, as I said before, what can we do now? Who else should hear this? Who do you think should be a part of this conversation on prevention? How can we prevent these types of attacks from happening? Here's my contact information and a number of links. And feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I'll be here for at least an hour, another hour or so, and I also have um, business cards here. Um, but I'll definitely be here for the Q&A portion of, this, um, of the session today. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. So I'm Predictive Security Advisor Zach Williams, and I work for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So if you just give me another two hours of your time, I'll talk about its critical infrastructure and why that's important. Uh, so if you're not familiar with CISA or the Cybersecurity Agency, we are the, the agency that is tasked with protecting the nation's critical infrastructure, both in means of cyber and both in, in, in the protective um, in space. So that's physical assets and then on cybersecurity assets. Uh, and that kind of spans 16 different sectors. Uh, we do this through a multiple different means, so whether we're doing for our physical security assessments, we're working with our um, Office of Bombing Prevention, our training and exercises, different things like that. Uh, there's three protective security advisors for the state of Georgia, uh, and those are the different counties that we cover. Um, I don't know, if most of the, the handouts I think should be in the folder for, um, for some of the stuff that, that we have to offer, as well as our contact information if you'd like to get a hold with us afterwards. Uh, so how do we do this and, and how can we bring some of the resources available uh, to you and your congregation? It should become as no surprise that, that soft targets and some of our gathering spaces um, are particularly attractive to those individuals that are looking to, to carry out some sort of attack. And there's a lot of different reasons that we could talk about, but primarily one of the reasons is, is a soft target. There is not a, a hardened structure of physical security in place uh, that would either be preventive in, in the case of an actual attack or would deter somebody from choosing your location as a, a target-rich environment. So how can we do that? Um, so through physical security assessments, uh, we will come on site, we will do a tour of your facility, we'll ask some pointed questions both on your policy and your procedure, as well as walk you know, through every nook and cranny and doors, and then provide back some options to consideration. So these are some things that you can take back to build a policy, to build some plans, um, or to use this information in your justification when you're applying for physical security grants, such as FEMA's nonprofit grant. We also have a, a faith-based uh, physical security self-assessment. Um, so you saw the amount of counties that, uh, that we kind of all cover. Uh, just this morning I was in 
Columbus. Um, so if if we can't get there and we can't uh, carry out the assessment or work with you on the assessment, we have platforms and resources where you can do an assessment on your own space. Uh, so this is an online platform. You go through and you answer some of the questions, and this will provide options to, uh, for your consideration, you know, as far as a roadmap and kind of a springboard, both to develop policy, for developing some training, and then for some different things to look at to improve your physical space. Uh, additionally, uh, Jakita mentioned it earlier, so we do active shooter briefings and preparedness. Um, so the, those are done in two different ways. Uh, we can do just a traditional run, hide, fight, um, which is just, just covering the methodology of what to do if those protective measures that we've discussed fail. Uh, but we also have workshops where we will go through and, and develop with you a annex to your emergency operation plan. So we, at the end of it, you have the run, hide, fight, but you also have a actionable steps on how to build an, an active shooter response guide for your facility. And it's targeted for your building, not just filled kind of with boilerplate language. Um, and the last part of that is, is we do a lot of tabletop exercises. So if you have drills, you need to do an exercise. You'd like to, to test what that looks like with your leadership and your law enforcement agency and you know, your social media experts, whatever, that all are in-house. Uh, we can do that in two different ways. So our website also has what we call a tabletop in a box. It's a free resource. Uh, you can download that. You fill in your organization's name. It gives you all of the PowerPoints. It gives you all the printouts all the way down to the invitation that you would send out to those that are participating. Or uh, you can get with us individually and me and some of my cohorts, the other PSAs in the states, as well as our training and exercise um, individuals here at the regional headquarters in Atlanta can develop a tabletop exercise for you. Um, so we'll go from the initial planning, scoping, we will write all the documents, we will produce the PowerPoints, we'll produce the handouts, we'll make sure that you have the uh, appropriate personnel at the table if you don't have those relationships already in place with your local first responders, counterparts at the FBI and so forth. Um, and then we will conduct the exercise and then give you back a report afterwards on an act or action on what you can improve on. There's my contact information. Uh, there should be a plethora of handouts um, in the folders that you have, as well as some of the other resources and all that are offered through CIS and DHS on protecting uh, houses of worship. Please don't hesitate to give me a call uh, to shoot us an email. And with that, I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thanks, Zach, and thank you, Jakita, for, for that. And uh, you can tell, um, I hope everybody's copying down their contact information. So many of these resources are available and the expertise is available to you um, for free uh, just by, by calling. But the, the through line that we're hearing is the planning that goes into this. This is not a one day um, kind of in the box seminar. It, it starts here uh, and begins here and there's a lot of planning um, and resources that goes into ultimately saving lives, which is our purpose. Um, so the next panel, the next discussion is on active shooters, mitigation, incidents, and investigations. And Supervisory Special Agent a Ashley Wolf from the FBI will be uh, speaking to us. Thank you. So Ashley, you want to come on up? Good afternoon. Um, well, one thing my mother always told me was that we shouldn't talk politics or religion, and I realize uh, that's going to be difficult to do in this group of people today. <laughs> but um, seriously, um, I'm, I'm from Georgia, and um, I was initially assigned as an agent with the FBI to the New York Division in 1999. And little did I know that two years later, while I had just gotten off probation, that 9-11 would happen. And I tell you this because it, it really impacted my life and how I viewed the importance of my job and what we do in the FBI to protect American citizens and how it's just imperative that we really can't get it wrong. And I, it, it just solidified my commitment to the FBI. And what I saw uh, during 9-11 was just the commitment that the FBI had to the American people and 
how important and imperative it was to work with our partners, every partner, and you are our partners, citizens are our partners. We cannot investigate crimes if we don't know about things. So we really depend on all of you to report crimes to us. So um, I say all that because I saw how the Bureau changed and adapted after 9-11 to that particular threat, and I want to tell you that the FBI is just as committed to this really challenging threat today for active shooters. Um, we have to evolve in the way our threats are presenting themselves to us, and that is what we are doing today throughout the organization, um, working with all of our partners and working with you. So. Um, with that, I'll tell you um, today, I just am going to tell you a little bit about um, our authority as the FBI in, in dealing with active shooters. I'll talk to you about um, a little bit about some statistics for 2021. I'll tell you about our squad and what we do on the threat squad. And then I'll tell you some resources. And I would like to show you the run, hide, fight, run, hide, fight video. Um, Okay, February 14th, 2018. Does anybody know the significance of that date? Parkland. Right, Parkland. Um, that was the day that a shooter, former student, went into the high school in Parkland, Florida, and killed 17 students. So that day, just to give you some history, in, in 2017, our public access line, um, which is in West Virginia, received throughout the year approximately 800,000 calls to the public access line and about 800,000 e-tips um, that whole year. We now are up over a million calls a year and a million e-tips a year. Um, in in 2000, six months preceding that shooting in Parkland, we had received two tips related to the Parkland shooter. And in review of our investigation into those tips, we could have done more. And so I'm here to tell you that that data is significant to us in the Bureau because it impacted change in the whole organization and it brought to life my squad. And so my squad exists in all field offices across the country today and to combat threats and trying to get ahead of the threat and preventing threats like Chiquita said. Okay, so this tells you our authority. I want to define active shooter. You probably already all know this, but it's defined as three or more killings in a single incident. In 2012, after the Sandy Hook shooting, the president gave the FBI authority to investigate upon request from state and local jurisdictions. We have to be requested to help investigate mass shootings. He gave that authority to the FBI, but we do have to be requested. Oh, let me let me just go back before I get into this. I did want to I did want to tell you some statistics, and I don't have this written up here on a slide, but in 2021, there were 61 active shooter incidents. That was up 50 percent from 40 in 2020. The 61 were in 30 states, and the 40 were in 19 states. That was 243 casualties in 2021, and that included 103 killed, and I have 140 wounded. In 2020, it was 164 casualties, 38 killed, and 126 wounded. About 50% of those 61 were apprehended by law enforcement, still alive. 25% were killed by law enforcement, 20% committed suicide, and the rest were um, either killed or apprehended by citizens. Five of the 61 in, were in the state of Georgia, and that includes the Asian spa shootings. We were next behind California, who had six. Just to give you some trends, because we all wish that we could identify what it is that, you know, that makes up an active shooter, but as it's been said before, it crosses all, all boundaries, but we try and put some trends to it. Most took place in June, 
on a Saturday between the hours of 12 and 6. About 33% were between the ages of 25 and 34. 60 of the 61 last year were male. 50% of the 60 took place in a business. 33% of the 60 were in open spaces. The remainder, which is a smaller, much smaller percentage, were in education, government, residence, residences, and there was one in the House of Worship in 2021 um, where there were no casualties, but that was the Mount Zion Church in Mississippi. So one emerging trend that I can tell you that F the FBI has put out is that we are noticing that active shooters involve roving shooters, whether it was a shooter who shoots in multiple locations, either in one day or various locations over several days. And we saw that actually with the Uvalde shooting where he shot at his grandmother's house and then he went to the school. We also saw that at the Asian spa shootings here in Atlanta, shooting over multiple locations. So now onto what our squad does. And just to, just to give you an idea of how important this is to us and the tips that we receive, we receive the majority of our tips from the National Threat Operations Center, which is, as I mentioned, is our public access line and it's located in West Virginia. And we, we run these down very, very hard. We are um, made up of five agents on, our, on my squad and we have five task force officers. As I mentioned to you, it's just critical that we work with state and local partners because they have primary jurisdiction. If you are ever involved in an active shooter situation, you have to call 911 first. The FBI is not the responding organization. We will, and we will help investigate and we will probably show up with resources um, upon request, which happens pretty quickly. But our task force officers are a GBI agent, Gwinnett County, DeKalb County, you'll hear from J.K. Walker here later today, he's on the squad, um, Cobb County, and I'm gonna, let's see, Gwinnett, Cobb, APD, GBI, and DeKalb. Did I get them all? We have five. Um, we are co-located with GBI and our Georgia Information Sharing Analysis Center, the Fusion Center, and that's hugely important because we actually have a memorandum of understanding with them where our National Threat Operations Center now calls down and they will dual route these threat to life, is what we call them, TTLs. So we have 24 hours to respond and do something with a TTL, whether it's, and we try to get that person, we, it's our job to communicate to the local law enforcement agency immediately where resources need to be and getting out to interview the subject if possible. So our squad helps identify subjects. We go out and interview subjects. We, we do as much as we need to do. We're issuing subpoenas because a lot of the threats take place over social media today. Um, but again, one of the trends that, that we have seen is that younger folks are feeling empowered behind the computer and almost all of the active shooters that we've seen are posting on social media. So if you see something, please report it. Um, again, 911, that's, uh, if you're in an active shooter situation, 911 is um, what you need to do and we investigate. So one of the things that we're doing we have a threat management coordinator on my squad as well. It's collateral duty, but we work with the behavioral analysis unit. And one thing we will do, if we see someone that we believe is very concerning, we will engage with our BAU unit to really help us understand this individual, what motivates them, how likely it would be that this person may turn for the worse and, and in, engage in violence. Um, I mentioned our GCAL, oh, GCAL, mental health is a huge piece of what we're seeing now. It's extremely concerning, the number of mental health situations that are involved with law enforcement. So we have an agreement, we actually work with the Georgia Crisis Access Line, that if we see someone who's in need of help, we will call her and she 
she responds within 48 hours. So this is a huge resource for us. And in addition, I know DeKalb County and Cobb County, Gwinnett County, they are all now have co-responder models where they will take out a mental health professional along with the law enforcement officer to help determine if the individual needs mental health and help get a plan for this person and get, get this person into medication or whatever this person needs. And that's, that's it. I put up our 1-800-CALL-FBI. That is our National Threat Operations Center public access line. And then the ETIP, submit an ETIP, is on FBI.gov. So here are some resources. It's FBI.gov slash survive, and you'll find on here a lot of things related to developing an emergency plan for houses of worship. You'll find this run, hide, fight video that you will see. You will find heat maps that will show you all the incidents that have taken place. You'll, you'll see several years of studies here that you can see. And it, you'll see also that we, I do want to quickly just tell you about the alert training. It is for law enforcement, but it's the advanced law enforcement rapid response training. If you're ever involved in an active shooter, which hopefully that's not the case um, incident, law enforcement is trained, and the FBI trains the trainer. We, it's, we, we actually um, train people in law enforcement on how to respond to active shooters because it's a difference in how we would go into a subject's house that we may have a case on um, for six months. This is to mitigate the threat as quickly as possible. So you will see law enforcement running to the threat um, to mitigate that threat as soon as possible. And it is um, a priority for the FBI to train as many people as we can so that they understand that the response to an active shooter is different than a response to an investigation that we've had going on for a long period of time. And you had a, have a lot of opportunity to plan to go arrest that subject. So you'll see that on the website as well. So I'll go ahead and, and show you the run, hide, fight video. Although it may be a little disturbing, it's important that if you have at least thought about it in your head, what you need to do if you're ever faced in this situation, um, you can at least think about it in your head and because that's half of our training too. We constantly have to think about if we go into a situation and we're forced to engage in, in violent activity with a gun, what are we going to do if we, if we go into a quick trip and someone has a gun, what do we do? So it's important to think about these scenarios so that if you are faced with this situation, you'll know what to do. Go ahead. Hi, can I get you started with drinks? Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta take this. We'll need a minute. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Hey, Man, you need to back up. You can't be here anymore. Get out of my face, what, man. You think I'm afraid of you? Get, get off me, man. Nine one one, there's a clip. Direct pressure to the wound to stop the bleeding until we can find a tourniquet. The 
the meantime, turn off your phones and make a plan to defend yourself. survive a mass shooting, if you're prepared. Remember, run, hide, or fight. Run, wherever you go, be aware of alternate exits. Quickly and cautiously evacuate in a direction away from the attacker. Don't hesitate. Seconds matter. Remember windows and emergency exits. Leave belongings behind. Keep your empty hands raised and clearly visible when exiting a building. Follow all instructions from the police. Don't stop until you're sure you've reached a safe location. Hide. If there is no safe escape route, find a good hiding place. Lock and barricade the door. Silence cell phones. Prepare a defense plan. Fight. Fight only as a last resort. Use available objects as improvised weapons. Use teamwork and surprise. A coordinated ambush can incapacitate an attacker. You're fighting for your life. Don't fight fair. Stop the bleed. A victim can die of uncontrolled blood loss in five minutes or less. Apply pressure or a tourniquet to control severe bleeding. Go to fbi.gov slash survive to learn more. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your time today. And please contact me if you ever have any questions or if you would like to speak more or you would like for us to come and talk with you as well. Thank you. All right, as we segue to the, the next uh, panel, I just wanted to remind folks that we have cards for questions or comments that are being passed out and be gathered up at the break. So that uh, we, can, we can answer your questions as best as we can given our limited time. So again, remember the cards for Q&A. Um, okay, so segueing to the criminal prosecution of hate crimes, I'd like to next introduce Assistant United States Attorney Brent Gray from the Northern District of Georgia from my office, as well as District Attorney Shannon Wallace to talk a little bit about that topic. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Brent, this is Shannon, obviously, and uh, I'm gonna speak first uh, because Shannon and I talked about it and, uh, and I think it'll give you a contrast between the federal law and the, uh, the state law if, if the, we talk about the federal law first. Um, that's the first time I've seen the run, hide, um, fight video, and this will definitely be uh, less uh, dramatic for you because this is just really about the law that exists, and, and we're not going to get bogged down in it, uh, but we think it's important that everyone understand sort of what the tools are when it comes to prosecuting hate crimes. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, I've worked for the Justice Department for uh, well over 20 years, and uh, I came to the department because of a church arson case. Uh, so like the U.S. Attorney told you at the beginning, this is not diminishing, and it's been with us for a long, long time. Uh, as you may recall, back in the 90s, uh, those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, there was a rash of church fires in the South. 
Uh, and one of those church fires was in my jurisdiction where I was working as a district assistant district attorney in South Carolina. And uh, President Clinton came down and suddenly the feds were involved and the feds wanted to take that case, but the defendants were my defendants uh, because it happened in the county that I was working in. And so I struck a deal with them um, that they could get involved in the case, but they would have to take me with them. And so that's how I became a federal prosecutor. <laughs> and I tell you that not uh, only to say this, that it's been a constant for my whole career uh, because that's how I entered the department. And unfortunately, um, there's been no let up in hate crimes and work of civil rights uh, since I've been in the department. Uh, there are two statutes that I'll tell you about today though, that, that um, are the tools that we can use to prosecute cases. One specifically has to do with uh, church arsons, uh, or excuse me, church damage or houses of worship. Um, and that is a statute that specifically was enacted after that rash of church fires. Uh, in the 90s uh, that addresses damage to religious property and obstruction of free exercise of religious beliefs. So both statutes I'm going to be telling you about are relatively new. This one was passed in the late 90s and the other one even more recently than that. Uh, this statute, um, not, and let me say, you don't need to worry about any of this. If anything happens that we can be of assistance to, we'll worry about the law, uh, but just so you know about it. Um, the statute is 18 U.S.C. 247, uh, damage to religious property. And of course, for a criminal prosecution, we have to talk about someone acting intentionally. This wouldn't be any mistake or accident. But acting intentionally, a defendant um, either defaces, damages, or destroys religious real property, meaning the building, the, prop, the land that the, prop, the church is on, any of the... Um, uh, pertinences to the structure. Uh, that's what we're talking about. So let me just pause and say this. Um, one of the things that I think is dramatically unreported when it comes to hate crimes that we really can do something about uh, and really make it a much more severe penalty for the subject are vandalism cases. So if you um, at your house of worship have any sort of vandalism whatsoever, even if you think it's not uh, very significant. Maybe the damage isn't great. Maybe it's spray painting or whatever. It fits our federal statute and we would take it very seriously and you would have the resources of the FBI to investigate that, even if it's a spray painting um, that can be cleaned up in a few minutes. Don't clean it up. Uh, call us or call the FBI and we would get involved in doing that. Uh, we would have to prove then that the defendant acted um, to do one of two things. Uh, either that he uh, or she, I suppose, but all the defendants that I've ever met have been men, uh, they acted because of the religious character of the property and the conduct affected interstate or foreign commerce. So don't worry about the interstate or foreign commerce thing. That's just the way we prosecute federal cases in this country. But importantly, it's because of the character of the building itself. You know, we would try to prove that the person acted because he didn't like the fact that Muslims, or that there was a house of, um, uh, or a mosque there, or a church there, or a, a Jewish temple there because of the nature of the building specifically. Uh, or maybe just because it was a religious structure at all, you know, without even uh, being specific to the type of religion involved. Or our other alternative is uh, that they acted because of the race, color, or ethnic characteristics of someone associated with the property. In other words, because people go there, not because they're Baptist, but because they're black. Uh, or not because uh, it's a temple, but they specifically do not like Jews. You know, if we could prove that element of it, we could prosecute it. An alternative either way. Uh, we would do it either way we could. The beauty of prosecuting the case based on the ethnic characteristics of the person who worships there is that we do not have to prove interstate commerce. And again, don't worry about interstate commerce. We can usually prove it, it just if, whether it affects business or not. Most churches, most houses of worship, most mosques, most temples have um, some amount of business going on. So it's usually not a challenge. But, but if it's because of the characteristic of the person, the race, the color, the religion of the person itself, 
his or herself, we wouldn't even have to worry about interstate commerce. So that statute has been around a long time. I mean, excuse me, has not been around a long time. It has been around since the 90s. Uh, but that's the main part of the statute. There's another part of the statute, though, that provides for obstruction of the free exercise of religion. In other words, I'm not there to damage the building, but I want to interrupt a service, right? Uh, and we can prosecute that as well. There are fewer instances of this, but uh, if this happens to your um, house of worship, please let us know. Please get in touch with the FBI or myself. I'll give you my information in a moment. But there we're talking about someone acting intentionally to obstruct by force. It has to either be by force or threat of force. Uh, in other words, it has to be somebody not just running in and hollering and screaming, but threatening force or using force to obstruct uh, a person's enjoyment of their free exercise of religious beliefs. And in this case, because we're not talking necessarily about the characteristic of the person there, um, that the defendant's conduct affected interstate or foreign commerce. Um, again, don't worry about that. If you, if you are a member of a, a faith community and someone interrupts one of your services by threatening force, certainly if someone comes in with a weapon or someone threatens to use a weapon or calls it in, you know, we've had this happen too, where someone's called in a threat ahead of a service and the service had to be canceled. Uh, then that would fall under this statute as well. So those are the, that is the statute, 247, 18 U.S.C. 247, is the statute that was passed by Congress after all the churches were burned in the South in the 1990s. Uh, more recently than that is a tool that we've used um, just recently here in Atlanta. We just charged a case under this statute just a few weeks ago. That's the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Uh, that was passed uh, right after President Obama was inaugurated in 2009 uh, and signed into law there in October of 2009. And it was a real accomplishment uh, for Congress in that they had entertained this legislation uh, for I think 20 some years before it was actually passed. Um, so this, this is a tool that really has improved um, the federal uh, response to hate crimes. And I'm just gonna run through this. It, it, this is not specific to religious worship or someone uh, attacking someone because of any kind of religious nature, but it can be. And uh, I'll just expose you to this. Again, don't worry about any of the real details. If something happens, let us know. We'll figure out if it fits the statute. But it's 18 U.S.C. section 249A. And this new law prohibits someone willfully, again, obviously you have to improve, prove intent with a criminal uh, prosecution, that they caused bodily injury. This is the catch. This, was, this is what is somewhat limiting. Unfortunately, to use this statute, someone has to be hurt. Um, and of course, it's in response to the murder of James um, Byrd and Matthew Shepard, both of whom were murdered. Uh, so that's why it, it, it involves bodily injury. So you have to either cause bodily injury or attempt to cause bodily injury with fire, a firearm, a dangerous weapon, an explosive device, an incendiary device, and because of the victim's actual or perceived race or non-racial characteristic status, which is listed in the statute. Um, there you go, that's that, that phrase. And so what are we talking about? Uh, it's got two sections. The first are racial hate crimes. Uh, and here you'll see the, they are, uh, you're willfully causing bodily injury or attempting to because of the victim's uh, race, color, religion, or national origin. So just so you know this, if that happens, the, the way it works under the um, federal law is that we do not have to prove interstate commerce. And again, that's a boring I'm not even going to get into that, but we don't have to prove that it affects any kind of commerce, which is normally the way the federal government's involved in prosecutions because of the eradication of slavery in this country. Congress has tied this part of the statute to the 13th Amendment. Uh, again, don't worry about that, but uh, if it's race, color, religion, or national origin, and you attempt to harm someone or you do harm someone, um, with the devices and the weapons that we talked about, then that can be prosecuted under 249. Um, there is another component, though, that's non-racial hate crimes, um, and that is that when someone willfully causes bodily injury, 
uh, or attempts to because of the victim's gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability. So this was the real um, development in the law because there was already a statute that I won't talk about today that address, addressed race, color, religion, and national origin. That's still on the books and we still use it. Um, but the real expansion with the Matthew Shepard, James Bird, the James Bird, Matthew Shepard Hate Crimes Prevention Act was this part. Uh, because there was no federal tool at all to address these non-racial hate crimes. Uh, but now we do have this tool that will allow us to prosecute um, bodily injury crimes uh, or attempts uh, based on the victim's gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability. The catch is, because this is not related to the eradication of slavery in the United States or the 13th Amendment, we have to prove that it somehow affected interstate or foreign commerce. But again, uh, don't worry about that. So that's a quick uh, run through of the law. That's my name and my contact information. Uh, I've been lucky enough the whole time I've worked for the Justice Department to uh, almost exclusively do civil rights work. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so that's my full-time job. So if, you've, if you have any concerns about anything that happens uh, or you just wanna talk about it or you want any training on it or if you want a further explanation because there's a lot deeper things we can talk about. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you at any time. So it's my pleasure now to turn over the rest of our time to a district attorney who I've had the pleasure of working with. And uh, as I said, I was an ADA, uh, but I've been very impressed uh, with Shannon Wallace, who works up in Cherokee, and uh, she'll tell you about the Georgia uh, hate crimes. Good afternoon. Kind of just to give you um, the view on the state side with the Georgia legislation, um, AUSA Gray talked about the federal law and in the federal statutes are actually separate crimes. In Georgia, our hate crime statute is what we call a sentence enhancement crime. It's not a separate crime that we can prosecute and get additional years, um, it just enhances the sentence. Give you a little bit of background on our legislation um, our first hate crime bill in Georgia was passed in 2000. Um, it was codified as OCGA section 1710-17 through 1710-19. Um, in 1710-17, when a defendant intentionally selected a victim or property of the victims because of um, the victims were the objects of the offense and that they, because of their bias or prejudice, the key words being bias or prejudice, um, unfortunately, though, uh, the debate in trying to come up with language in the legislation um, using general terms and, and the nonspecific bias and prejudice led the Georgia Supreme Court to find that statute unconstitutional in 2004. Um, between 2004 and 2019, there was some movement in the General Assembly to pass um, a more specific hate crime bill in Georgia, but all of these attempts failed until February of 2023 uh, when the public outcry over the Ahmaud Arbery case really came about. Um, at that point, the General Assembly became more motivated to pass a hate crime statute to revisit what the Georgia Supreme Court had found unconstitutional about the previous statute, and that led to the General Assembly passing House Bill 426. Um, because of the pandemic, the session that year was delayed, uh, but in June of 2020, Governor Kemp signed into law House Bill 426. In that bill, which took effect July 1st of 2020, uh, again, it is a sentence enhancement bill, um, but the trier of fact actually has to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intentionally selected the victim or the property of the victims based on actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender, mental disability, or physical disability. Um, so basically, it replaced bias and prejudice with the specific race, color, uh, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender, mental disability, and physical disability. Um, as I said, this is just a sentence enhancement. So what does that really mean? Uh, in Georgia, if you were to commit, for example, aggravated assault, um, 
The statute actually says that you could be punished anywhere from one year on probation to 20 years in prison, and that discretion is really left up to the judge to come up with your, your sentence. Um, under 1710.17, what it does is it increased, if we could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant intentionally selected his victim based on the protected classes, then the minimum sentence would go from one year on probation to two years. So the minimum sentence is what is increased. Um, this applies to both misdemeanors and felonies. So there are designated misdemeanors that I've listed here um, that are covered. And instead of some misdemeanors, you can just receive a fine. But if we again can prove that these were, uh, the defendant intentionally selected his victims based on the protected class, then the minimum sentence would be increased to six months, not more than 12 months, and a fine of up to $5,000. And if it is a felony offense, the minimum sentence would be two years and the maximum fine would be up to $5,000. Okay, so what does that mean and what kind of evidence is it that we're normally looking for as a prosecutor when we're trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this is a hate crime? Uh, first and foremost, you're usually gonna be looking at the confession or admissions of the defendant or any statement that the defendant has made. Um, I have been a prosecutor for 20 years now and I am really never surprised at what a defendant will say when they've been caught, and especially in these types of cases. It is almost like they are bragging or boasting about what they did and why they did it. Uh, the words of the defendant, both at the time of the event and also after the event, are important because what we are having to prove is really the state of mind of the defendant. Also, you're gonna be looking at the social media. Um, rarely do we have prosecutions these days when social media is not extremely important because again, most people um, are on social media and most defendants are very loose lips for lack of better words. We look at their posts, what they like, comments that they make, we also look to things that the defendant has written, whether it's texts, emails. I mean, again, it is very common for us to uh, have defendants who have cell phones, for cell phones to be seized when crimes are committed, um, for those cell phones to be examined and to find um, a wealth of evidence regarding uh, the defendant's past conduct, the defendant's motive. Um, we also look at things like tattoos on the defendant. What is it that those tattoos may say about organizations that they're involved in, about hate groups that they are a participant or associate of? Uh, we look at the statements of the individuals who know the defendant. Interviewing everybody who knows a defendant when hate crime is potential is key. You're gonna talk to every single person that you can that has known that individual from the time they were young to the day of the offense. We're also gonna be looking at Memberships and association uh, with hate groups. Um, again, I am, am always really surprised to see how blatantly open defendants are with who they associate with and, and, and why they associate with them. Um, other things that are important for us to be able to show the state of mind of the defendant is, is gonna be expert testimony. I know one of our previous speakers talked about the behavioral um, analysis unit of the FBI. Um, that is something that we've actually used in cases that we were investigating for hate crime. Um, the resources of the federal government have been wonderful, at least for my jurisdiction, in helping us. They have a lot more resources in many situations than the states um, or the local jurisdictions can have and can be an excellent tool in helping you not just investigate but also in prosecuting. Two other sections, uh, OCGA 1710-18 and OCGA 1710-19, are also a part of House Bill 20, uh, 426-1710-18 is the notice requirement. The state is required by law to file a written notice um, alleging all of the specific factors that we are uh, authorizing the enhanced sentence, and we are to file that at or before arraignment. 1710-19 is the procedure statute, and that basically just tells what exactly we have to do when we are moving forward on the prosecution of a hate crime. Um, the trial is what we call bifurcated. So the first step is we have to prove the guilt or innocence of the, or, or, well, I actually have to prove the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. Once we do that, once either a judge or a jury has returned a guilty verdict, 
Then we move to the second part of the trial, which would be where the trier of fact has to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the detention, defendant intentionally selected the victim or the property as objects of the offense for the reasons that we set forth in our notice. Once, that's, uh, once that is done and the trier of fact has found beyond a reasonable doubt that this is in fact a hate crime, then it would be up to the judge to um, hand down the sentence in that case um, based on the statute um, 171018 as far as the minimum and the maximums. The final piece to House Bill 426 that was passed and went into effect in July of 2020 is what we call the reporting requirement. Again, somebody earlier was talking about the importance of um, the community reporting and the law enforcement actually tracking uh, bias, hate-based crimes. The Georgia General Assembly found that to be key as well, and they enacted OCGA 17420.2, which requires law enforcement to prepare a bias crime report in all investigations of hate crimes, whether an arrest is made or not. Once that report is made, all the law enforcement agencies um, are required to submit that to the GBI, the GBI is to publish annually in the Georgia Uniform Crime Reports. This is a new law. Again, 2020, that's during the pandemic. Um, as far as, as I am aware, in Georgia, I am not aware of any case that has been successfully prosecuted under the hate crime statute that the sentence has been enhanced. Um, now, mind you, we are still, every jurisdiction that I'm aware of in Georgia, still trying to climb out of the pandemic. Most people are still prosecuting cases from 2019 and 2020 prior to this law going into the effect. So I imagine in the near future, we're going to start seeing cases where the hate crime sentence enhancement portion has um, been successfully used. This is my contact information. Again, I'm the district attorney in Cherokee County, um, which is the Blue Ridge Judicial Circuit. Um, my email address and my phone number, if I can ever be of any assistance to anyone, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right, we're going to take about a 10-minute break. Uh, it's 2.40, so we'll just plan on starting again at 2.50 back in here. Um, there are refreshments in the lobby area, so please help yourselves while you're here. Again, we'll start at 2.50, and if our panelists can be back in the room a, a couple of minutes early for questions, we'll, we'll do a little Q&A when we begin. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I'm going to take six weeks um, and then start in August. Yeah, yeah. August 15th. Good luck to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, 
All right, everybody, if we could begin to retake our seats. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know the, how valuable that is. And I'm going to do a, a short Q&A at this point. Um, some really good questions were asked. Um, and we'll do a couple of those questions. I'm afraid we can't get to everybody's question, um, but we will send out. Um, we'll have a little bit more time at the end for Q&A and then at the end of the program after it's concluded, we'll send out information on resourcing um, so that you, you have that as well uh, and have all the resources um, that we've been referring to during the course of the seminar. So let me, let me start off um, and ask that our speakers who are answering the questions come to the mic, which I think is here, uh, in answering those questions. I'll go ahead and, and read out the question, although I may summarize a little bit. Um, 
but ask uh, our, our speakers to go ahead and respond to them. So let me, let me start um, generally with, with a question about security teams. I know that many houses of worship have their own dedicated security teams um, that serve. There's a question um, from a member of a security team as to what the expectations are of that security team, perhaps if they notice something unusual, um, if, if they have questions, um, if they have a, perhaps a, not a 911 call, but something that they want to discuss, who, who do they call? And I'm going to call on our HSI friends, uh, Jake Heater, Zach, to answer that question. Again, a non-emergence situation, in an emergency, you should call 911, but if you, you see something that maybe is amiss um, in your congregation or house of worship, and you, you just want to get a gut check on it, Zach, who should they be talking to? What is the expectation? Yeah, of course. Sorry. I feel famous or something. Like that. Um, yeah, so obviously, if it's an emergency, call 911. Um, if something's going on, uh, don't hesitate. Please don't call me. Uh, I'll probably be fishing or you know messing with my chickens or something. Um, so I may miss it. Um, if you are, you know, you're noticing these things and you're kind of developing, you know, your, your plans and procedures, I'd say that's one thing you need to sit down and develop. What is... What is our reporting process? What do we do if we see something suspicious? Who are we giving that information to within the organization? How are we acting on that information? What What is the follow-up and those sorts of things? So that needs to be defined to some extent, needs to kind of be tested to some extent um, before it's actually, bless you, rolled out into um, into actual practice. Uh, the other thing I, I think I included in, and it should be in one of the handouts, is the power of hello. Uh, so that is just a, a simple way to introduce yourself uh, to make it known you know to people that are coming it, it, it's a house of worship so it should be welcoming it should be a communal experience but that doesn't mean that we just completely put on blinders and we don't look at anything uh, so just developing that policy developing those mechanisms to hi hello welcome can, where can I sit you how are you have you been here before and kind of asking questions in a non-threatening manner gleaning some additional information and then kind of from those cues reporting that information as appropriate and those and those reach outs are really welcome um, speaking for law enforcement it, it, those conversations well before anything that that happens are critical to making sure that um, you all are not only getting guidance, but the relationship is established before something happens, and that's that's really important. Um, second question is uh, about grant um, granting. You you mentioned that in in your slide presentation, Jakita. Can you can you talk a little bit about the TVPP grant program and how it might assist? Houses of Worship in getting security funding mm -hmm. um, and in other needs. What kinds of things does it cover? Oh, sure. So um, before I answer that, I want to go back to the other question. Um, of course, as Zach said, of course, you want to dial 911 and, and try to get more um, secure within. Um, practice that. Do exercises. How do you, when you see someone um, who may be exhibiting those concerning concerning behaviors, um, practice how do you walk over and what do you say? Um, you know, I am putting on my um, Baptist ushers hat, um, and so we were the gatekeepers at the door, and so we were trained. What if we saw something? If we saw a suspicious package, if whatever it was, um, and then what you know what to do about that? So practice and train on that. But then um, also, I spoke in my briefing about those support services. You are the first ones that someone may come to um, for counseling, um, for just to, to have a conversation for prayer even. Um, and so when you, you see those, um, if you see some concerning behaviors, there are resources that you can um, provide to them, for instance. Ashley had in her presentation um, the Georgia Crisis Access Line. I usually like to tell people, call them. They're 24-7, 365 days a year, and they can provide. It's for um, those who do not have insurance. So if there's a, you're having an issue, you need a counselor, you need a coach, you need um, shelter even, you can call GCAL. You can call that 1-800 that, um, that number. And so, um, and then you also have those support services right there in your um, your house of worship. Um, I'm sure you have a, a food pantry or 
um, a, you know, a clothing drive. Sometimes you can provide shelter and, and other things. That those are those um, that things that could potentially turn into grievances and may send someone down a pathway of violence. So think of those things. Kind of think broader about how you all function um, as a as an organization. Um, and then, so about the grants, yes, the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Grant. So um, Zach will tell you about how to harden, so your infrastructure, how to harden your structures, how to harden the inside. What we focus on is what I just mentioned, like those support services. If you wanted to start a youth resilience program within your um, house of worship, if you wanted to start an awareness training, just the same way I provided that awareness to you all, if you wanted to go throughout your community and provide that information, um, or start conversations. We want to take people off these pathways. And so if we see someone going down this pathway of hate, um, or violence, well, how do we get them off? And so start that conversation. Um, so that's those are the grants that we provide. Um, and, and Zach will tell us tell you more about the non, um, oh no, just forgot, non secure. Yeah. Um, so there, there's yeah, funding it's SGP. There's <laughs> funding available through FEMA, it's the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. Um, and with that, it's an allocation of funding uh, where you can purchase cameras, lighting, uh, fencing, gates, access control, things like this. So I think this year the funding was $150,000 per organization. Uh, there's only a couple requirements you have to meet. You have to have a physical security assessment. Uh, you have to have an investment justification and then have some sort of mission statement that highlights that you are a nonprofit and, and, and particularly a house of worship. Uh, so with that funding, then you can, it's a three-year grant cycle. You receive the money, then you purchase, you know, cameras, lighting, fencing, sorts like that. So uh, I highlight you have to have a physical security assessment. That's what drives the vulnerabilities. That's what's going to point out what needs to be mitigated. Um, and then from that, that's actually what you're going to use to apply for the grant. Um, so the money's there. Uh, the It just closed this past year, I want to say beginning of May, somewhere in there. Um, so you have a whole nother year to kind of start working on the grant and getting those different things. The funding goes through the state. Uh, so just Google GEMA. NSGP, there's a tons of information from the state. Uh, the state can do a physical security assessment. It's a lot of times your local first responders can help with that, um, or we can do those as well. Um, so there's a lot of free resources for physical security assessments without having to use any uh, resources and pay for that. Please don't pay for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Ashley, one, one quick question for you. Um, we'll round out. Are there resources like Run, Hide, Fight that target um, young folks that, that actually would be appropriate for a younger audience? I, that that film is obviously disturbing. Yeah. Um, is Are there other resources out there that we might show to folks who are a little younger? We don't have anything specifically for young people. However, there is a video on YouTube that's about a one minute video that's a lot less graphic than the one that you saw here today um, that just discusses run, hide, fight in a very basic manner. But it still shows a person running and things like that, but I don't believe there's as much graphic nature to that video. So I think it would be appropriate. It's um, school oriented. Yeah, it's school oriented. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, and it is on YouTube. Cool. One last question, Ashley. Are, it, it, in submitting a tip on somebody that you have a concern about, is there an age threshold for that? Yeah, great question. No. Um, you do not have to have your age submitted at all. We will take a tip and we will determine um, based upon that person's writing or, or voice or whatever they're providing in the tip, whether, you know, we're going to take it seriously no matter the age. So there is no age limit. We just encourage um, whomever does have a tip to report it to us because most times, honestly, um, an individual that is younger is seeing the threat because, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a lot of young people who are making these threats and committing these violent acts, um, especially at 18 years old, like we saw in uh, the Uvalde shooter. So most people that they're communicating and conversing with online are younger. So one of the things we saw with that with that shooter in retrospect is that he was talking online to a lot of younger people, 15, 16. If any of those people had perhaps submitted a tip to us, um, 
we would have been grateful. So we, I encourage um, younger folks to submit tips to us that if they see anything, please you know, tell them to submit a tip. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so we're going to head into our next, pan our next uh, presentation, which is on developing security plans and protocols. Neil Rabinowitz um, from Secure Community Network is going to lead the discussion. So if Neil, you are here. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, usually this is after lunch and everybody's kind of tired, but I hope this, the, uh, everybody's still with me. But so what I want to talk about today, um, so actually let me just, just back up. So I'm the community security director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta. I actually work for an organization called Secure Community Network. And we are a network of security directors uh, that, that protect the Jewish community nationwide. Most of us are all fed, uh, former federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, uh, or military background. So we kind of work together, um, sharing in, in information, sharing intelligence. And so I'm on the ground here in Atlanta doing that for the Jewish community. Even though that's what I do, and as, as I talk about plans and procedures, um, what's important to remember is all these best practices, it's, it, 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 they apply no matter what, what the faith, right? There, there are obviously, there are gonna, going to be nuances depending on, on, on the way folks worship. But everything that we have on our website is available to all of you. Uh, there's, a, there's a form in your packet called low cost, no cost security measures. I'm gonna go through that in a minute and, and exactly what that is. But feel free um, to take what, and I'll put, up, I'll put my information up at the end. On our website, feel free to take, take the documents, put your logos on it, cut and paste, whatever you need to do. What, what's more important is that we get the information out there for everybody to use. Um, so if you need, and like I said, not only our website, but if you, you know, hit me up, you'll have my contact information and I will provide all of the, uh, the documentation uh, electronically for everybody to use. So when we talk about plans and procedures and why they're important, other than the obvious, right, they, it, it, they, they keep us safe, what, what's so important is to recognize that, you know, we have to get past the point where we think, well, all these bad things, yes, they happen, and they happen frequently, but they happen somewhere else, right? That doesn't happen here. This is a safe community. My organization is small. Nobody's going to come here. It's so important that we get past that idea that all those things happen elsewhere so that we can plan and prepare and be ready. Training and, and, and um, uh, emergency plans and procedures, Having those in place, or it's empowering, right? It's it's you know it, it kind of a, a an analogy, obviously you know on a, on a smaller scale, but it, it applies because I think we've all been in this situation, including myself. You know, you're heading home from work at the end of the day, or wherever you're heading, you know, from. You're tired. You look down. You need you know your your, your gas tank's on empty, right? The first thing you think of is you start rationalizing why you can wait till the morning. Right, I'll just deal with it tomorrow. But inevitably, that's when things go 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 wrong. Right, you you oversleep, you're late, there's a wreck, you start panicking, you start you know you can't function right. It's under stress, it's hard to think, and and then it's human nature to want to freeze in instances like that. When we look at you know obviously like I said a smaller uh, analogy, but when we look at having our plans in place, doing training, it, it, it empowers us. It's, you know, it's human nature, it's very easy to panic with fear if we, if we don't know how to respond, but by preparing, we do know, you know, we are in a place where we can respond and we can react, and that's how we stay safe and survive incidents like this. So when we talk about security plans and, and procedures, we're talking, you know, I'm supposed to talk about plans, but we, but we have to look at it holistically. Training, everything that goes into it. And I know what you're thinking because if I were sitting in your seat right now is, and some presenter pulled up a slide that said governance and governance and assurance, I'd be checked out too. I promise you, you'll take away practical information. This is just a way for, for us to show you all the elements that go into, uh, into a security program. It's not just putting up fences. It's not just writing a plan and then not doing anything with it. It's all, all these things go into it that are extremely important. So this slide kind of takes what we just saw, all those elements, 
And the thing to remember is we, we can never say that our organization or that our community is safe. We're done. We, we've secured it and we are now secure. This is always a work in progress from the beginning. So your first step, and this is a little blurry and I apologize, but the first, the yellow dot says, you know, just like um, my, my uh, colleagues from DHS were talking about, having that a security assessment done. Right? And, and after you know, Zach explained how that can be done, but that gives us a baseline of where our organization stands as far as what, what are our vulnerabilities, where can we improve, what should we look for to, to harden our facility, do we need cameras, do we need more cameras, you know, do we need a fence, a panic alarm, whatever it may be. Um, but it, you'll notice it's, it's a flowing diagram. So then once we have that assessment, then we can start to build our plans around that, understanding our vulnerabilities. And then the next step, we can have the best plans in the world, you know, but if, if we don't share them with the folks in our organization that need to know them, and we don't, we don't know them very well, and we don't, more importantly, if we don't drill on them or practice them, then they're, you know, they might as well just sit on a shelf collecting dust because it's so important to practice those. Not only so we, could, we know what our plan is, but inevitably when you practice your plan, you will find areas that you can improve on. Like, well, we thought this would work, but you know, in practicality, when, when we actually physically act this out, it's better to do it this way. And then we go back and, our, and we tweak our plan and, ad and adapt it. So you can see it's a constant, constant um, you know, flow. You know, we get to the point towards the end, imagine the arrow just coming right back to the, the, the threat assessment, right? We're always, at least annually, updating that and updating our plans and, and moving forward. Always trying to improve on, on you know, where we are uh, security-wise. Um, the other thing that's important, generally speaking, is that when we look at security, uh, a holistic security plan, it's a layered approach. It's not just the fence out front or the security guard or the cameras. It's, it's working in, inward, in, from inside outward. So it's our plans and then it's our communications plans and then it's our training. Training, like I said, training is so important because it empowers you know, our staff, our, our members, our congregants, whoever it may be, to know what to do in an emergency and to, and to, and to put those plans into place. All these layers, it's just like when, when, and I know, you know, when Zach and, and I'll do physical security assessments for the organizations um, I advise as well, when we look at physical security for an organization, we're looking at concentric rings of security. So in other words, we're looking from the outside in because we want to identify any type of threat as early as possible. So first we're looking at perimeter fence, our perimeter of the organization, and then working our way in. Do we have enough cameras in the parking lot? Do we have access control on our doors? More importantly, and I'm gonna talk about a culture of security, we may have locks and access control on our doors, but do we use them? Are the doors locked? Are the doors not propped open? And those are the rings we're looking at for physical, physical security on the green, you know, you see on the green, green uh, circle. And it's the same thing uh, on the holistic approach as well. We're looking at those multi layers and all those layers mesh together to form our, 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 our hardened physical and um, uh, procedural security plans. So to put it into practice, it's hard to see, I apologize, but um, this, this, I really want to highlight having that culture of security because as I started this job, um, I was a, I didn't mention before, but uh, I was an FBI agent for, for 22 years. When I started this job, so I'm, I've been focused on like my, my colleagues, security, safety, you know, you name it, it's been forefront for forever. When I started this position though, I, I quickly learned that organization by organization, some are very in tune to security. They get it, they, they work proactively. I was just with an organization this morning, we were, we were working on their plans for the Jewish high holidays, which aren't until the end of September this year, but it, you can never start preparing early enough. So you, you know, that, and it runs the gamut from organizations like that all the way down to, well, and I, I'm sure every, every religion has, has a phrase, but God will take care of it. We're in good hands. Well, you know, we, we can give God as much, you know, we owe it to our congregants our, and our staff and everybody else in our building to provide as much help as possible. So, it was a very big learning experience how important it is to foster within your organizations that culture of security awareness. I mentioned before, we can have state-of-the-art access control, 
the best cameras, the best technology, but if we don't lock, if we don't use, close the vehicle gate, or if we don't lock the doors, or if we don't teach people that it's, don't prop doors, even for convenience, then, you know, it's, it, it, then all, those, all that fancy technology isn't worth anything. Um, and it's fostering that, and, it, and it's hard for, you know, it, it takes a while, but it's just a matter of slowly fostering that culture in your organizations to be more aware. Um, just as an example, the, the Jewish Federation building is in Midtown, a one-story office building. We have a perimeter fence and we have a vehicle gate that it, it slides open very slowly, but more importantly, it slides closed even slower. So it, it's take, I'm still working on it, but you know, the first, one of the first things I did was try to explain to folks why when you come in, please let the gate, you know, pull up and let the gate close behind you. We don't want anybody piggybacking. It's, you know, or, or people walking in, you know, not only, not only because of, of the threat, the religious threat, you know, anti-Semitism, et cetera. We're in Midtown Atlanta, things happen. But it's, it's been a lot more difficult than you can even imagine. It, it, it takes time, it, it just, it's, you know, trying to explain and remind people. So it's all those little tweaks that go so far to keeping your organization and your facility safe. Um, Along the lines of small tweaks and things, I know, you know, sitting here, I can say, you know, cameras and, and, and fences and everything, that's extremely costly. And it, for many organizations, is cost prohibitive. One of the documents or the publications we have in it, it should be in all of your folders, is uh, low, cost, low cost, no cost security measures. Um, like I said, this is, I can send it to you electronically. You are welcome to use it however you need for your organization with your logos, et cetera. But it lists, it's page after page of small things you can do um, that enhance your security, you know, that, that's, that are affordable, that are either no cost at all or low cost. Things like being, you know, minding your landscaping, keeping bushes a certain height, keeping, you know, the, the, the grounds around your building clear so people, people can't hide or suspicious packages can't be in place. All little things like that, you know, like I said, not propping the doors, making sure you, you lock the doors, et cetera. So, that, that, that goes a long way, and, and like I said, feel free to let me know if you would like that electronically, and I'd be happy to share that with you. After we have our security assessment done, we understand our vulnerabilities, now we have to write our plans. Uh, what we call an emergency operations plan, and it's just that. If something happens, and I know sitting here, we're, we're kind of focused on active shooter, if the worst case scenario happens, but just like your security program being holistic, Look, your, your emergency operations plan should look that way as well. It may not be an active shooter, right? It's more likely it could be uh, uh, active nature, a flood, a tornado, a pipe burst, um, a fire, you name it, any type of threat, either man-made or natural. So your, your plan will you know, generally kind of talk about who's, who, what are the roles for your staff, who does what in the case of an emergency, and what's important with your emergency operations plan is that it's scalable. So, you know, just like when, when I was in, in the FBI and my colleagues here sitting here, we could have an incident or an event or some type of operation. That doesn't mean we're, we're standing up the big command post and everything's rolling out. It depends on the scale or the size of the, the, the issue or whatever we're dealing with. Same thing with your emergency operations plan. Your, your rollout of your emergency operations plan could be two people just going to address something versus a large scale crisis or incident involving your organization or your community. Um, we have, it was too big to, to print and put in your package. But we have a template of an emergency operations plan, and it lays out the scalability, you know, the different levels of what you're looking for as far as the types of incidents and, and, and the large, you know, how, big, how big that footprint has to be. And then it has a number of what we call annexes, uh, emergency functional annexes at the back, where it addresses the specific things to your organization. In the event of a fire, here's our evacuation, evacuation route. Here's where we are going, the, our reunification site. In the event of a suspicious package, here is the procedure. So again, that's on our website, it's, and it's it's large, but it's plug and play. It's essentially plug in your information and it's very easy to use. Again, you're welcome to have that as well. An emergency operations plan, often referred to as an EOP. 
And I think I'm running short. I'm going to move a little, little quicker. But then once we assess our situation, then we improve. And that's part of uh, improve on our security posture. And that's where the plans come in. OK, let's write the plans, uh, the emergency operations plan, everything else we can think of. What I want to point out at the top here is if you notice, I'm, if you recall back to the, the slide with the circles, the physical security and the human element, they have to, it works together. We, you know, e either by themselves or not a, a holistic or, or a solid security plan. Um, you notice at the top, you know, we have, um, you know, access control, but with ushers and greeters or, you know, guards, but with those orders and they understand what, what, what they're asked to do and, and what they're asked to, 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 to be aware of. And you see that for all those things, you see that human element involved. And then as we improve, then we can deploy, then we can look at our physical, you know, how do we harden our targets? What physical security measures can we in place? Now we're looking at, you know, deploying cameras or a panic alarm. Um, to me personally, I think a panic alarm for an organization is huge. Um, you know, in the event something happens, the, the quicker that we can get that message out to everybody in the building that there's an issue, that's how lives are saved, right? We're, we're, we're trying to, we're, we're, those precious few seconds where everybody gets that message, there are systems out there, some of them are costly, some not so costly, but where we can notify everybody in the building all at once that there's a problem and they can, you, like you saw in the video, they can run, hide, or prepare to fight, um, that's what saved lives. And then after that, this is kind of the end of that cycle, and then we're, we're going backwards. If you remember the slide with, as it flows, now we're, you know, we've done, we've deployed everything, now we're looking back and, and practicing it again and, and conducting drills or tabletop exercises. I can give a plug to my DHS colleagues. Um, their resources are great for tabletop exercises. I've, I, I, I've relied on them, um, and, it, and it's very helpful. And it, and, it, and it teaches your staff members as well. Most, most of the folks I have probably not been through a, a tabletop exercise or know what it is or, then, or a drill, and it's just, it's excellent to, to Practice under a little stress, but practice before before it's needed, before that emergency hits. Hopefully, it never hits, but before it does. And then finally, um, I did hit on this already. It's that should a crisis hit, then you're looking at your op emergency operations plan and its scalability. You know, how, w whatever that incident is, does it affect my organization? How big? You know, how much does it affect my organization? You know, the how does it affect our, our operations? Um, and just Judging from that, and like I said in, in the, uh, the template that we have for emergency operations plans, it explains all that scalability and where you'd be looking at, okay, well, now we're at the next level and we need more help for this, or now this is going to also impact our business operations and we have to come up with a business continuity plan or, invoke, or, or implement our business continuity plan. So there's my information. I'm also, if uh, our website is secure community network, all one word, dot org. And like I said, there, there's a lot of resources on there. And feel free, I know a lot of speakers come up and I, I know I can speak for all my counterparts. We all mean it. If, if you need anything, let us know. That's, you know, hit me up and I will send you whatever, whatever digital uh, documents you would like. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, so we're at our last panel discussion now, um, which is security plan Im implementation and adaptation lessons learned. And it'll be a moderated panel, so Sergeant Walker, if you could come on up from the DeKalb County Police Department. He's with the Homeland Security Unit and Mer Emergency Management. Good afternoon, everyone. I can promise you all this is probably one of the greatest parts of this uh, presentation that you all will enjoy today. It is, will be my great pleasure to bring up people who actually are sitting in the seats that you all are in, and they're going to share with you all how they go about implementing security plans at their place of worship. So at this time, I would like to go ahead and introduce uh, four um, individuals who will come up and will serve on our panel today. 
so with our first individual, I would like to bring up Mr. Mark Jacobson. He is the executive director of the temple. If you could come on up, sir. As he's coming up, I would like to go ahead and announce the next person that will sit on our panel. Mr., uh, I'm sorry, Miss Pastor Stella Hall. She is the pastor of communities at Belong Church Atlanta. Next, we have Mr. Eric Delabar. He is the security subcommittee lead at the St. Catherine Episcopal Church. And last, we have Mr. Earl A. Burns, Jr. He's the senior security advisor at the Church of Apostles. And while Mr. while Mr. Burns is coming up, before I get started with questions here, I just want to give you all a reminder. You have some, you should have some index cards left over. We're going to allow a time spot for you all to be able to ask them some questions um, here in a couple minutes. So if you have some, some questions that may be percolating in your mind now that you may want to ask them, go ahead and write them down because we have a couple. I have a couple questions I'm going to ask them, and then after that time period, it will be open for you all to ask them some questions. Uh, but you will need to place those on your index cards. So beginning with our um, panel here, the first question that I have for, and each one of them is going to do this, they're going to, they're going to describe uh, their house of worship. So we can actually start on this end and work our way down to the end there. Whoever wants to grab the mic first. Good afternoon. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Earl Burns, and I am the Senior Security Advisor <clears throat> at the Church of the Apostles. We're a non-denominational church. We sit on I-75 um, as you head north on I-75. We're located, um, we consider ourselves an, an urban church, and we have approximately, I checked yesterday um, as I was going out before coming here, and um, they said we have approximately a little less than 3,000 members now, and my role um, being a former military member, I like to say that my role in the church, I'm the strategic guy. I am not the security director. My responsibility is to ensure that the, the ushers, the, the greeters, we also have a church school and a nursery at our church uh, is to ensure that they get trained um, and also that um, I interact with the security director and who is a, a member of the Atlanta PD. He has a sidelight. He assigns officers. We have eight APD officers who work with us. Thank you, Earl. Um, I'm Eric Delabar. I'm uh, associated with uh, St. Catherine's Episcopal Church in Marietta, Georgia. It's a uh, uh, suburban church, uh, kind of off the beaten path off of 75, uh, off of Roswell Road. Our size is, we're kind of a mid-size. Uh, we have about 370 families. Post-COVID, we our attendance is down because we still have people that are more comfortable watching it online. Uh, we average about 165 people uh, on a, on any given uh, service uh, day. Um, my role has varied over time. I've been a vestry member uh, on the on the church council as part of the leadership um, and. In my official capacity in dealing with with security and and stuff on for my day job, I've incorporated that through the help of GEMA and other resources that I've gathered to to establish a, a security plan, a security assessment, and uh, 
And, and so I've kind of taken that role on ad hoc. Everybody's volunteers. We don't have a formal security team uh, or uh, law enforcement who are extra duty or anything like that. It's all internal. Uh, so. Thank you. Good evening. I am Stella Hall, and I am pastor of Communities for Belong Church Atlanta. I'm the baby of the group. Um, we are, we will be two years old in December of this year. And so we were birthed during COVID. Um, however, our membership has grown quite a bit and we, we're, we're global, but we're also in person now. And so we are about five to 650 people um, that are on the road currently that comes to the in-person services. And so my job, my assignment, I train, or I'm responsible of the leaders getting trained um, all of our belong group leads, all of our pastoral care leaders. We have a security team, but they're all volunteers. And so we are building our plan, and I am excited to be up here with all of this great wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Jacobson. I'm executive director of the Temple. We are located on Peachtree in Midtown. Uh, if you think the movie Driving Miss Daisy, we're the temple that's featured in the movie. Uh, I'm executive director. I've been there for almost 45, I've been there for 45 years, celebrating uh, 45 years last month. At the temple, we always have uh, concern for security because we know there are bad people out there intending to do bad things. And we know that on October 12th of 1958, our temple was bombed. So security and having that be a first priority has been part of our DNA, at least uh, since that time. Uh, as executive director, I handle all of the non-religious, uh, non-worship related, non-educational aspects of the temple. We have uh, 1,600 membership units that relates to about 4,000 individuals, so we're large. And we uh, are on five, uh, five acres in Midtown, and we have three different uh, buildings that are all uh, connected to each other. In addition, we have a, a facility uh, on our property that houses Aid Atlanta, um, Atlanta's oldest and largest aid service agency, and a shelter for homeless couples called the Zabin Parity Center. So as part of uh, my role is to make security uh, a part of everyday life Whenever we uh, plan something, there's a programmatic aspect, there's a food aspect, and then there's a security aspect. Thank you. Ashley, Mark, you can hold on the mic right there, please, sir. Uh, so this next question is for all of you all. Some of you all actually answered it in your introductions. But the next question is, um, can you all briefly describe what safety and security practices do you have in place at your house of worship? OK, I'll start then. Uh, we have a, a security committee, um, a chair, a vice chair that uh, will take over for the chair so we can always uh, have uh, a continuity. We have 10 to 12 people that are on the committee representing all aspects of our temple. Uh, we have to have representatives from our early learning center community, from our seniors community, from our uh, Sunday school uh, operation. Because when we talk about security, um, what's good for one particular aspect may or may not work on a consistent basis for others. So uh, the key to everything is having uh, that uh, committee that will coordinate uh, and be able to cross-pollinate um, uh, our security uh, procedures. We employ uh, off-duty Atlanta Police Department officers for our um, security during the day. Um, we're um, 90,000 square feet uh, on that five acres, and we have uh, officers uh, located at each one of our main entry points, one at the main uh, part of our building and the other at our early learning center. But everybody's part of our t security team. Uh, we, um, as being part of the Jewish community, we're very fortunate that we have people like Neil Rabinovitz, uh, uh, at Secure Community Network. We're fortunate for the United States Attorney's Office for having a session like this. 
and uh, to have the and our defamation league, the ADL. And these resources uh, are there for us, uh, and we use them, and we talk about them. Um, we, um, we believe in see something, say something. Uh, we don't take anything uh, for granted. We're, um, our maintenance team, um, our office team, they're always aware of the cars in our parking lot, uh, if there are any that are unfamiliar, or if there are any that have been sitting there for a while. These are the kind of uh, awareness kind of things that uh, we do to enhance our ability uh, to uh, be secure. Thank you. Thank you. Currently, we use um, a security team that we have in the parking lot, a, sec um, a security company that circles our parking lot and keep the cars and stuff safe. And then we have off-duty officers, too, that we currently use on Sundays when we have service. Um, but then we have a security team that's responsible of walking around and making sure um, everyone has a different post. It's about five of them, and they have a different post in which they serve currently. We just moved from Austell because we were using two officers, off-duty officers in Austell, but now we're currently in, we just moved within the last two weeks, Paulding County. So we are learning and getting acclimated with Paulding County so that we can use, um, get officers from that particular county until we build like we want to build. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our security procedures uh, have, like I initially said, started with, with kind of go, going over the, the general plans from uh, GEMA used to have a website, uh, and I'm, I'm, I've been promised that they're repopulating it, called Praise and Preparedness. Um, and uh, that provided all the templates that Neil and others have talked about as far as developing uh, your, your threat assessment of your facility, of, of developing a plan of action for how you're going to go about it and everything. So I took those templates and, and actually established our security plan, if you will. Um, it didn't really go very far after that because they, the vestry said, oh, well, thank you very much, but we're concerned about other things. So what, what I did initially was uh, in dealing with, and I, I actually learned this from a previous House of Worship seminar, where Creflo, Do Creflo Dollar's um, uh, security director uh, talked about security in depth and reaching out as far forward in ahead of the the uh, the house of worship to greet the people as far out front as possible. So in a big church like his, he had deputy sheriffs that were out there patrolling the parking lot and 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 controlling traffic, and uh, which is not a big thing for for our church. We don't need that. Um, but we have people that, that are outside the church that are observing people as they're coming in and helping direct them. Then the ushers and the greeters, uh, two different uh, uh, duties, sometimes it's the same person, but again, they're the first person that reaches out to, that, to the individuals coming in the church. And any active shooter training, any hostage situation, any, any uh, threat mitigation will tell you that the, the best way that you can mitigate a threat uh, in, in many circumstances is by putting, giving eye contact and a personal touch to, that, to the individual coming in. So if you greet them eye to eye, shake their hand, say welcome, good morning, thank you for coming today, we're, we're glad you're here, that's going to disarm them a lot of times. Uh, now, if a, if a person is intent on doing it regardless, that's not going to help. But in most cases, that will help mitigate uh, just kind of a, a spur-of-the-moment uh, incident uh, where a guy just is, is all riled up and, and just, you know, wants to do something. So what we did was we established uh, for our ushers and greeters an incident plan, uh, procedures on what to do. So for outside visitors, for outside disruptive visitors, and this was mitigated, this was in, instigated because we had uh, some people coming to protest from 
uh, that were affiliated with the Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas uh, who came to Marietta to protest against pride uh, festivals and then on their way out of town that Sunday decided that they would pick on our church to, uh, to protest against um, uh, what they perceived to be the, the beliefs of the Episcopalian Church. Um, they were misguided, but that's okay. Uh, health and safety issues, natural disaster, mechanical and structural failures. So, so for the, the University of Georgia students, uh, we, we of course have a, a, just a one page sheet, you know, because we know they can read. And then uh, for the, the Georgia Tech students, which we have a lot of uh, Georgia Tech graduates, we actually did a, you know, a, a if, if then diagram. So if this happens, then you go to the next one. Uh, and they really like that. So it, it's, a, it's a real quick, easy diagram uh, or the words for those who, who prefer words on, on what to do for various different situations. If somebody has a heart attack, you know, where's the, where's the, uh, the defibrillator on the wall? If, you know, uh, if somebody tries to come in uh, and disrupt the church, what do you do? If, if a tree falls on, on, the, on the church, if a water line breaks. Uh, so we have those established baseline procedures. At, at the Church of the Apostles, um, we have uh, off-duty police presence. So anyone coming to the, the campus will see as they drive up, we'll see uh, police officers off-duty. Um, you will see um, a police officer, he has his dogs there, and you will see a police cruiser. Um, and then when you go, especially when you go up to the nursery area, you will see police officers there who stand outside the nursery. And also up in the Sunday school area. I mean, these officers have been there for a number of years and everybody does know them. Um, and they're all interconnected. They've been, and we all know each other. So if there's anyone else, the greeters and the ushers, we all know one another and there's a relationship there. So if someone knew, just like Eric says, we do greet one another and there's a relationship that we have with one another. And I've, I've been a member there for over 10 years. So that's, that's very important, just as Eric has said, that the eye contact and greeting one another. And besides being the senior security advisor, I have my own, the church, when they found out almost 12 years ago, I was a retired FBI agent, they said, why don't you start a safety and security team so I have a safety and security team that sits inside the sanctuary that my responsibility is to have that team to evacuate the sanctuary, and that's it. Um, Dr. Youssef has his own private security team. Their responsibility is to worry about Dr. Youssef and Mrs. Youssef. So our team is to evacuate the members and the congregants if there's an emergency such as a fire drill and we're trained to do that. So those are the safety and security practices that we have in place at this time. Thank, thank each and every one of you all for that. We're gonna kinda of do what we call a hot shot round and this is where there's gonna be a question that's directed at two of our board members here. Um, the next question is going to be directed at Pastor Stella and Mr. Mark. Uh, the question is, uh, both of you all have mentioned, um, you know, how police officers assist you all with safety and security at your church. But outside of police, who else uh, assists you all with your safety and security measures? Well, currently we have uh, volunteers that are on our security team. Then we have the ushers and the greeters, and then we have staff. All of us are on duty. We're watching. We're looking. 
um, we're participating on things that that happen, happened. One Sunday, we were um, in service, and someone just walked to the pulpit. We all jumped up at the same time because we're all looking and um, just, and it wasn't anything, but we just assumed it was. Um, so we all work together. We have walkie talkies, all of that, so that we can hear what's going on as well as service that is going on at the same time. Thank you. It sounds like we're all very similar in that uh, we um, all have uh, awareness. We all seem to uh, engage uh, off duty uh, police officers. Uh, from our perspective, that's uh, very important uh, and don't want to preempt any future uh, questions, but the only armed people on our campus are our trained uh, off-duty Atlanta Police Department officers. Our committee members are there to meet and greet uh, and to be sensitive uh, to the different types of people that come into our congregation. Our congregation isn't all white and look like me. Uh, but if someone comes in looking different, you want to treat them with the same dignity and respect, and you need to welcome everyone when uh, it comes to um, big bags or uh, backpacks. Uh, we have to train all of our volunteer greeters and ushers that they check everyone, not just the people that might look different or might not be as clean or ready to come to services and things of this nature. Uh, uh, a key element for us is our maintenance team. Uh, they're the people that know the facility before uh, every Friday night and before every Saturday morning and on Sunday mornings when we have a lot of people in the building. Uh, they walk around the building, they look inside, they look outside, and they know if something doesn't look right. Uh, we use that term a lot, C says and say something, DLR, doesn't look right. We want to, we want to remain in a state of playing cops and robbers uh, all the time to uh, make sure that everything's in place the way we want it to be in place. Um, so from our standpoint, it's uh, communicating with our APD, communicating with our staff, communicating with our volunteers, and then a key element, once again, is the maintenance team. Because if you really want to know what's going on in the congregation, ask the maintenance team. They know. <laughs> Thank you both. All right, so the next question is for um, Pastor Stella and Earl. Uh, how do you all deal with having armed staff or congregation members at your place of worship? Currently, um, those that are licensed, some of them carry, um, but we're in the midst of changing that now. And so only those that are doing security on duty will be the ones to, to carry an armed uh, a weapon. And all, even though we're licensed and all of that, we are not going to be able to bring ours into the building, but those that are on duty will be able to. So we're in the process of revamping that right now. Thank you. The only persons who are authorized to carry weapons are former law enforcement, and there are former law enforcement who are, such as myself, who have the requirement to qualify once a year. Like, I am required to qualify with my weapon um, once a year. And of course, the APD officers have a requirement to carry a weapon, and they do have a requirement to qualify. Now, with that being said, um, I came up to an usher, and he's told me, he said, I'm carrying a weapon, and you're not going to take it from me. And I said to him, well, you go on and carry your weapon. I'm not going to do nothing about it either. You know, what, what could I do? You know, it's just one of those things. I mean, that's between him and his maker. I mean, because on the door, it says that you're not supposed to be carrying a weapon. So I'm not going to get in a debate with him about it. At the end of the day, he knows what the rules are. And... Um, that's the way it is. 
Okay, thank you. This, um, this next question is for um, actually any of you all who want to answer this, and if you could just limit your response to two minutes, but how would you all go, how do you all often, let me rephrase that, how often do you update your security plans? And if so, where do you get your information from to update them? Well, when I first arrived, um, my responsibilities, I, I just had the safety and security team, but when I got elevated to the position of um, senior security advisor, that's when I decided it was time. So in the last couple of years, um, I decided, I sat down and I met with um, the folks from Homeland Security. So in the last two years, it's been a thing where I've been in, in the process of updating because everybody had their own plan. You know, the people, the ushers had their requirements. Um, the folks in the nursery had their requirements. And so since I've been there, I made the decision. What I did first, I had Homeland come in and did do their safe, their security assessment first entry. They came in and I found out what the gaps and the requirements were to close those gaps that were there. And after that, now I'm sitting down and writing to the plan after I sat down with all the individuals to close those existing gaps. But we are blessed in the respect that we do have cameras. We do have controlled access. So um, I've gone back to homeland and ask them to come back and do a deeper dive into our because we did well but after um zach came in he said oh you just did the just the the low level you need to have them do the really deep dive mm. so but anyway um needless to say we're going to do a deeper dive and make sure that we cover all the bases but do involve everyone together instead of having piecemeal. More, more, more of a holistic approach to it. Got you. Thank you. Anybody else want to? It's a, it's an, a, a recurring thing um, because it's part of my job day to day. I, I kind of keep an eye on on how things are going, and parishioners will bring bring concerns to the vestry, to the clergy, to myself. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll have a discussion. And, and if it's something that can be immediately mitigated, we do that. But the the plans are, are I always keep an eye on them and try and keep them up to date. The vestry has re-engaged me as far as trying to start to implement some of these things. And they're looking at um, uh, enhanced security measures. We do have a preschool, uh, so we have you know, uh, little children and, and teachers that we have to worry about. Um, uh, and we have training that anybody who's involved with any of the ministries uh, has to have uh, uh, diocesan training for uh, protecting children, protecting uh, congregants uh, in, in a uh, safe environment. Um, so, you know, the a a person can't be alone with with a with a child or or even children. Uh, there has to be at least two people. During the day, all the all the exterior doors are locked, um, and only there's only one access door that has a a uh, motion sensor on it, so it notifies the uh, the front office that somebody is entering in that one door only. Uh, and they have to walk by the the front op the front office, uh, so those type of the type of things we mitigated on a day to day basis, and and we're always reviewing those things. They're going to be enhancing security, the vestry, 
uh, we have a vestry member here for, for my church. Um, they uh, uh, has, has agreed to start uh, providing uh, some enhance, security enhancements and we're studying whether or not, uh, for instance, we have way too many people with way too many keys to the church. Mm. Um, so we're going to roll that back, start changing locks, maybe put in a, a keypad access and stuff like that. So it's an evolving thing. Um, there's a natural rhythm uh, in our congregation uh, such as the High Holy Days that Neil mentioned and the beginning of school years. So uh, uh, just like, you know, one is to change the batteries in your uh, smoke alarm every change of the uh, time zone, uh, we use the beginning of the school year, the beginning of the High Holidays as one time to review all the procedures because there's always new faculty, there's always new staff that need to be uh, trained and be made aware of where rallying points are. God forbid there's an active shooter situation and things of this nature. The other natural rhythm, natural rhythm is the nonprofit security grant. Uh, we apply every year, um, and that means we need to get a security assessment every year, even though there may be some guidelines that they're, they have a, a shelf life of longer than one year. But it's also part of the natural rhythm of uh, that opportunity to get the grant, but it's also an opportunity for us to uh, take a step back, get the assessment, and see if we're doing everything that uh, can add on to what we're already doing. Okay. Uh, we are actually approaching our last question that we have for our panel members. So again, if you all have any questions that you would like to ask the panel, panel members, this is the fine time to go ahead and write those questions down so we can uh, make sure that we respect your time and get out of here in a timely fashion. So the last question actually is going to be directed towards uh, Mark and Eric. Uh, a lot has been talked about the places of worship and securing the places of worship. Um, but how important is it to have a relationship with other places of worship or health professionals or even um, public safety departments? How important are those relationships outside of the place of worship? Well, very important. It's very important to know uh, if uh, who uh, is the zone commander in your zone. Uh, we establish relationships with the zone commander, uh, zone five in the city of Atlanta. We get to know who the director is, or who the commander is, who the assistant commander is. And in many cases, it's more important to know the assistant commander uh, even more so than the commander. Um, and uh, we have relationships with other uh, churches up and down Peachtree, part of the Peachtree Carter congregations. And uh, while we may uh, approach our faith in a different way, uh, when it comes to dealing with um, people who don't look right, homeless, uh, security, vandalism, stealing uh, copper from our uh, uh, HVAC units and things of this nature were all the same. So um, we have relationship with, for us, across the street, Savannah College of Art and Design, SCAD, that's a rallying point for us. We also have a relationship with the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, which is about a half a mile down uh, Spring Street. Uh, we're a route there, really pound rally point for us, a reunification point, and vice versa. And so, uh, once again, that's one of the things that has to be constant. You have to do that every year um, because personnel uh, changes. And uh, we want to make it known to our Atlanta Police Department folks that uh, they can always come in and use our restrooms, our facilities. They can stop by and have a, a cup of coffee. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we're due for other visits from the three different shifts of the Atlanta Fire Department to have them come visit. And they're just so uh, open uh, to coming and visiting and being uh, walked around the facility. And um, uh, God forbid you'll never need it, but if there ever is an emergency situation, uh, the police that come in and visit you that are on the beat or the fire department that's in your zone, uh, they kind of already know your facility and know that you're real people and uh, that you call them in a good time, not only when there's an emergency. Um, we have a, a pretty good relationship with our, with our greater community. Um, we have a very personal relationship with our fire department because our church burned. 
Um, and it was uh, during it was during a uh, capital expansion project several years ago. It wasn't in, intentional, um, but uh, you remember things like when the fire when the two firemen run inside the church while the thing's on fire. They take the cross off the wire and bring it out. It was it was a very it was an incredible moment, but. Um, so the, the fire department knows us well. EMS knows us well. We have a lot of old congregants, just like any other church. Um, and fortunately, we also have a lot of professional medical professionals as congregants. Um, but so we have a response there, and, and the ambulance knows how to get to us. Um, and uh, so, same with the PD. We need to develop a, a better relationship with our precinct uh, uh uh, it, as far as uh, the Cobb County Police are concerned, uh, but they're they've always been responsive. But uh, it's it's always a very good idea to to make sure that they know your facility. So in the event of a worst case active shooter, they know where the corridors are, where the stairs are, where where the exits are. And, uh, and they can only do that. The fire department knows that because they have to come in and do inspections, but the, the police department does not. So that's very important. As far as the community is concerned, we have a lot of relationships with uh, beyond just the, the Diocese of Atlanta um, and uh, for the Episcopal Church, but through Family Promise, which is a, a collection of, of uh, uh, houses of worship that help homeless families, and each each week a different congregation. Uh, we have we have Jewish, Catholic, uh, Protestant, uh, uh, Islamic that that actually care for uh, process, pe people who are family members or families that are homeless that are vetted. And they come in and they stay in our in our facility for a week, and then they're processed uh, on a daily basis for training and 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 clothing and all that stuff uh, through Must Ministries, um, which a lot of different communities are involved in. We're also very involved with Must Ministries. Uh, what the point of that is is that it's a it's a greater community that communicates very well with each other. And so we're always sharing information. So if anything's going on in any particular community, you know, the word's going to get out. Um, so that's, that's how we handle that. But um, again, I want to think, I think I want to emphasize that, that it, it's, it's all about communication and working together with all, all of your partners uh, and your congregants so that you know what your assets are and who you can reach out and touch. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so so now we have our questions from the audience at this time. And so um, for the sake of time, um, we have uh, what, four questions here I'm going to ask. And for those of you all who feel that uh, you have something uh, to provide based on these questions, please feel free to do so. The first question is, how do you change the culture to be more safety minded? That's almost a million dollar question right there. Um, all right. I think, unfortunately, circumstances have done that for us. Um, people are very aware uh, when we had when we had our visitors from from out of town uh, come and try and tell us what was wrong with the way we worship. Um, that kind of opened everybody's eyes, and so those type of things. The the you know the the shooting uh, just last week. My uh, my rector reached out to me and said, "Did you see what happened in Alabama?" Um, where they were just having a potluck supper and and somebody shot up three of the members, um, and so it, it's something that you you always have to focus on. Um, but okay, yeah, yes. 
Well, unfortunately, uh, in the Jewish community, uh, many of the things that you all have seen in the news, in addition to the African-American community, the Muslim community, every community is getting targeted by somebody wanting to do bad things to those people. But the Jewish people uh, uh, seem to have been um, uh, picked on throughout the ages. And so it's very much a part of our uh, DNA, as I said before. And uh, we manifest it in um, our giving. People pay an annual support to the congregation um, to support uh, everything that we do. And we segregated out uh, a security fee. So our members um, manifest that uh, through their um, generosity. Uh, and uh, part of the part of their philanthropy to our congregation every year is to have a part of that segmented towards security. So there's a, a high awareness, and uh, I think uh, uh, very much like Church of the Apostles and others, you know, where when you walk when you come to worship and you see the police officers, you know um, that there's a concern for safety and security. And um, I think that you know our members were blessed that. Uh, if they see something, uh, they say something, and uh, many times they apologize uh, because they don't think it's anything, but uh, we, like uh, some of the other speakers uh, before this session have said, it's, not a, it's nothing to be embarrassed about to ask a question. Um, it, it's, uh, there's no such thing as a stupid observation. The only time you'll find out of this, if the observation is stupid if you didn't make it. Thank you both for that. So our next question is, how does your house of faith fund your security system and processes? Is it with operational capital or grant funds? We haven't received any grants. Um, we are blessed that we are able to fund it through our, our operating funds. Um, at this time, um, you know, when we when our sanctuary was built, um, it was the the cameras and everything else. Um, but I'm gonna look harder at that now um, because of all the things that were going on. You know, we have a a worldwide ministry um, called Leading the Way, and some of the things that Dr. Youssef in his five year plan has that I may have to look at things a little bit differently and look at some grants. Gotcha. I'm starting on the grant, grant package for next, next year, uh, as soon as we're done here. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, our, our vestry allocates it through the annual budgeting process, um, and, and they've made, made a uh, conscious effort to, to start addressing those issues. We currently use operational funds and the donations from the parishioners. Yeah, we, uh, as I mentioned, we do have a security fee uh, part of the communications that we do to our members. Uh, it, um, it covers maybe 60% of what we do, but we have, um, we have a $7 million budget and 6% is uh, devoted to security. That's a lot of money that could go to help other people uh, it's a lot of money that could uh, enrich the spiritual lives of our members. But um, uh, we have uh, uh, found that you can't do anything if you can't come and worship uh, and feel safe and secure. Uh, so um, operational funds, grants from time to time, um, and our security fee um, uh, line on our communication to our members about their support. Thank you all. The next question is, what is the estimated cost for armed slash police services? What's the estimated cost? I can, I can kind of answer that personally myself since I am a police officer. I can tell you all right now in DeKalb County, if there's an officer that works a part-time job at a church, sometimes that cost can range from anywhere from $40 to $60 an hour. Um, and that's, that's just based on you reaching out to the nearest precinct, asking for an officer to work your services on Sunday, whether it be for traffic, whether it be for, like they're saying, for safety pur purposes where it's just a visibility, that price can range anywhere from, from $40 to $60 an hour. And the volunteers for that. 
Oh, so um, the other question to piggyback on this was, are there any recommendations for security companies? Any recommendation for security companies? I will, I will say this, and, and again, I'm, I'm answering, um, I'm, I'm kind of judging from them. They, did you all have any recommendations? Uh, I will say this, if you are a church that has a security company, and again, I'm talking from the experience of being in law enforcement, I would greatly suggest that you reach out to your precinct and let them know that you have a security company that works the properties of that campus. Reason being, when that 911 call goes out and we respond, if we do not know there's a security company there, there may be a slight problem and issue. We have people here with guns. We, all we got to call is there's a bad person here with a gun, and there may be some confusion going on. That's a, it's very important to have that relationship with your precinct and your lo local police department. And just, and I think it was even mentioned here about, you know, inviting the firefighters and, and, um, to have coffee. You can do the same with the police department. Invite the police department to come out and have coffee. Let them know your, your, um, your layout. And especially if you have a recent addition, because I, I've been in that boat myself where I responded to a call in the church and all of a sudden like, where did this building come from? And that's kind of delayed our response to that 911. So we just have two last questions for you all here. What is one security measure or policy your house of worship has added that surprised you for its effectiveness? Any, any surprises that they've kind of thrown in there? <laughs> it, it really has been effective, I think, and, and just my personal opinion. Watching, use the mic, use the mic. Watching how, how the ushers uh, interact with, with, the, uh, with our visitors and our, our regular parishioners. And when something is, is going on, somebody's always paying attention and always uh, Providing feedback to the appropriate people, um, you know, and we we have designated people who are responsible for locking up at the end of the day and all that type of stuff, but but that's the most uh, I think uh, significant thing is that people are sharing information. I think that what has happened recently is that the ushers and the greeters have wanted to be more integrated into the security, you know. Um, I once had a training where I brought Zach in and um, I had over 125 people come in who wanted to sit and listen to Zach speak on a Saturday morning at 8 a.m. in the morning. And- um, Well, that's because it's Zach. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so uh, that was the thing. Um, this was in, at the end of April. Um, the numbers of people, they want to be more integrated and into what's going on. And everybody now knows who I am. Mm. You know, I kind of kind of was in, they, before they knew who I was, but now they really know who I am. Got you. Anyone else? All right, well, I can promise you all, this is the last question, and this is something for each and one of you all. Um, what is a simple, immediate security measure you would recommend? What, what, what is a simple, immediate security measure you would recommend? I'll start off. Currently, we are in the process of now making sure that uh, only those that are assigned to work during that day are, is carrying a weapon so that we're all on one accord and we all feel safe doing service. I would say if um, one doesn't have a security committee in the congregation to start one uh, immediately, uh, the, um, a committee that is diverse, a committee that covers all aspects of the congregation. Um, our, um, uh, when it wasn't just up to me as executive director, uh, it's great to have lay partners um, that have an interest in it. And uh, it allows some people that not everybody 
in one's congregation is perhaps into the spiritual aspect or the education aspect, but they like the community. And a great way to serve in a community way uh, is by um, being on a security committee. I think the most important thing you can do initially is, is engage your, your, um, your first responders, uh, fire, EMS, and police. Um, develop those relationships, give them an awareness of your facility and, and uh, the aspects of it, and, and that'll help you a lot. I think that meeting with all the heads of the, of the different committees in your church um, and just trying to find out what are their fears and trying to address all the fears. I'm talking about the facilities people, um, the, the clergy, the, the nursery just getting them all, to, if you can't get together with them in a room, um, get a pad, just sit down with them for about 30 minutes and just try to find out those gaps and then to address those gaps. Um, I think that's very important. So when you sit down with um, the police or anyone so you'll know you can speak with in intelligently to them. Could we please give each and every member here a round of applause, because this has been very insightful information. Thank, thank you all. Y'all can stay there. I'll be quick. <laughs> Have a seat, Eric. Have a seat. Um, so it's interesting to me that the questions got more frequent toward the end, which I think is a good sign that, that the, the information is sinking in uh, and the thoughts are developing. Um, thank you all again so much for coming out. I'd like to thank uh, each of our panelists, uh, the, the team here at the Carter Center, particularly Lisa Wiley, uh, the ADL uh, co-sponsors, uh, Jessica Weinstein for all your help as well. Uh, the AV team here, Brandon Bishop, uh, the proof of the pudding catering who provided the uh, refreshments, uh, and then particularly the folks uh, from my office, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, Danielle Sweat Wiley, Nefertiri McKenzie, Diana Todd, our law enforcement coordinator, Shala Hawk, who's standing over here, who's probably uh, your point of contact, uh, and I will volunteer, Shala, to continue to be your point of contact. Uh, for issues that you have. Uh, we heard from Brett, Matt Carrico handles domestic terrorism uh, cases in our offices here um, as well. The interns who helped, interns from our office, raise your hands, the lights in my eye. Thank you all uh, for helping out. Uh, I'm reminded, I grew up in a small Baptist church in rural Alabama, and now that I think about all of this, the ushers there did double as a security team. Uh, they were an imposing group of people uh, who not only did they provide uh, safety, but like punctuality and everything else that, uh, that was important to a young person in church uh, back then. So thank you all for coming out. I hope that this uh, meeting is the start of your relationship with some of the professionals here who can help provide some resources and, and advice. And if we can ever be of any help at the U.S. Attorney's Office, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you.